Mini episode 391 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. 30 seconds. In front of all these people, you're going to pull out a gun and you're going to shoot an unarmed man. 20 seconds. So what are you going to do? 10. Welcome to the FDH Lounge and the Justified Episode Recap. It was justified. With your original dignitaries. Fire now! Rick Morris and Jason Jones. You got ice cold water running through your veins. Breaking down each Justified episode. The moment they've concluded. Did you take a peek inside the soul of Raymond and you? Let's go let that old dog lie. Real-time reactions. Next level analysis. You seem to be harboring a bit of hostility there, brother. So I've been told. And now, your dignitaries. Well, I believe we can take her from here. Welcome to mini-episode number 391 of the FDH Lounge. You've got original FDH Lounge dignitaries Rick Morris and Jason Jones joining you to talk about what was a much more action-packed episode 5.9 than certainly the last three. The most action-packed one since 5.5 shot to hell a couple weeks ago. Looking forward to hearing what my man Jay Jones thinks about tonight's episode. Jason, what do you think? Uh, how was 5.9 as far as entertainment value for you? Well, um... Let's keep one thing straight. Uh, I, I, I found last week's episode to have a great amount of entertainment value. It may not have had a lot of bloodshed or double crossing necessarily, but um, I thought last week was important. Uh, this week was completely different, and I can absolutely see why this is the kind of episode people were kind of hoping tonight would be. I got to say, though, um, it was. It was more, more justified, you know, guts, so to speak, than we're used to seeing. Uh, probably going all the way back to uh, the episode you just referenced. Um, I will say though that the introduction of Eric Roberts, uh, I think, even made it just a hair better than without. So it was a very good episode. Um, to be honest with you, I'm still. I got another minute or so here in it, so I don't even know how to finish it, but um, I thought it was a great episode. I don't know that it was better than All Shot to Hell, but I think it was very good, and for those that were upset about last week, you got to at least expect that this was a nice bounce back. All right, well, spoiler alert, I I kept saying there at the end that uh, the DEA agent Eric Roberts was going to end up fighting it. What ends up happening is Dewey Crow decides to try to kill two birds with one stone, guns the truck right at his cousin and at uh, DEA agent Eric Roberts and, uh, again, ends up uh, making off from the scene, driving away with the blow as sort of the ultimate loose cannon there at the end. He only really grazed his cousin who looked pissed and who was going to be out for revenge, but uh, I was kind of calling it there, watching it, that nothing good was going to happen to DEA agent Eric Roberts, as I really enjoy calling him, but you had texted me uh, during the show here about that him and Raylan, it might make an interesting spinoff as uh, offbeat slash uh, cops on sort of the dark side of the law, doing things their own way. It's very interesting, Jason, that if you just peeled off some of the noir elements of this program and you just went for the grittier, flashier stuff like that, you put those two guys together as swashbuckling cops fighting crime, that could be a network show. I mean, it wouldn't be as artsy as some of the stuff on this program, but as far as pure entertainment value, you know, you could plop that on a major network and probably pull good ratings. I, I just think it would be really fun. The idea that, uh, as we saw with Art, you know, there's this whole, if you don't like how I'm doing it, then you can transfer me. Okay. Uh, but instead of transferring within the Marshal Service, you have Raylan uh, changing careers and going over to the DEA. And you have sort of, you know, these two guys that operate on the, the gray side of legal. You know, they get results by any means necessary, kind of a sort of buddy cop, but dramatic sort of way. It would be a real easy way for Raylan to walk away from what, however this justified situation is going to end. Uh, and I think it would be absolutely incredible. You're right. It wouldn't have the the polish or the 
the coloring that Justified does, and, and it could be literally a procedural drama type of thing, uh, and because it would be in Memphis and not in Kentucky, you have a whole new plethora of uh, bad guys you could you could bring into the fold. So, you know, on the spur of the moment, yeah, it probably works, but I don't know that that's any direction that they would actually go because I absolutely loved uh, Raylan and I don't remember his real name, so we'll just keep calling him DEA agent Eric Roberts uh, going in and pursuing the hot the you know the hot rod line. You know, trying to hunt him down and doing so, you know, in their typical smart ass sort of way. They were fun to watch together, no question about that. They they had a real great uh comedic chemistry to them and uh it, it was just hard to take your eyes off of the screen. They were very compelling together. Speaking of hot hot rod, uh, R. I. P. Z Z Top, as we have come to uh, know him over a period of time here. A uh, very interesting that uh Z Z Top's boys there you know, you, you saw a lot of the lesser lights on the show tonight really kind of angling. You saw them angling there. A, a great King Lear speech uh, before uh, DEA agent Eric Roberts ended up popping them there at the end. <laughs> Very entertaining how that went down. They were angling. Daryl Crow Jr. really kind of angling there with his whole thing coming clean to Boyd earlier on about the double cross that he had pulled. But, uh, again, in that meeting, angling for 20% later on, that, that whole United Nations of, of criminals meeting that they had there. So it was kind of interesting juxtaposing the wannabes there versus Picker, who has really proved to be the ultimate survivor at this point, versus Wynn Duffy. Thank God he was back on the canvas tonight, and versus Boyd Crowder. And my only question about that is the way that we've seen it with Boyd, and I started to think this way after I shot all the hell, when, when his plans against Sheriff Mooney and Lee the Undertaker and all that were coming to fruition, are we getting to a point now of where Boyd's almost just invulnerable, of where it's almost like deus ex machina as far as Boyd is going to vanquish somebody and then they're going to be dead and out of the way? I, I just almost wonder if we're, we're not sort of overdoing it with Boyd the Superman at this point. Well, yeah, but isn't that how it always plays out, uh, whether it's fictional or based on true events? whether we're mm-hmm. talking about Nino Brown or American Gangster or The Godfather or whatever, every single story I think we've ever run into where you see uh, a person of modest means uh, take the rise and, and create an empire, and eventually, you know, it ends, and, and they, they die, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword kind of thing. But I think the the saving grace of this concept, although – you're absolutely right, it never really seems realistic, is that this, this is how it goes. They're, you know, that's how they get to a point where they can fall so epically is because they've been invulnerable for so long. Uh, Scarface, you know, a lot of people want to make claims that Scarface is such a great story, and it's really not, but um, his whole thing was, you know, how far can you go before you, you fall? And when he fell, he fell hard. So um, I think... It could be part of the process. I never put anything past this writing group. Um, so in my mind, yes, it's not realistic. And, and the fact that he just sort of stood up in that in that scene and just said, why don't we all just pull and see what happens? Let's all just start shooting and see what happens when the dust clears. Like, that is sort of typical of this point in a you know mob boss type of mentality. He's going to get to a point where... You know, let's just have it out and see what happens because I'm going to win. And eventually he's not going to win, and that's where the story ends for him. So, yes, it's unrealistic, but I think it fits perfectly in line. And I wouldn't put it past this group to, to think that they did it on purpose. Well, the only concern that I have, and I've referenced this previously on the show, and, and that, again, uh, Wes Thatcher, a long-time uh, pro wrestler slash promoter slash trainer slash announcer, a guy who's been around the wrestling business his whole life, that he has said on, on different podcasts how much he loves Justified and how he sees like classic pro wrestling booking at work here. And I see a lot of the same parallels myself. One of the criticisms of unsuccessful wrestling booking, you look at John Cena over the course of the last decade, uh, the whole criticism uh, on the uh, Internet r- wrestling community, the IWC here about Super Cena. He never sells fear. He never puts over his opponent enough 
to where you think they're a threat to him. And that's why a lot of his big programs haven't drawn the way that they have. That's why his program against Nexus a couple of years ago was short-circuited because, again, he didn't really sell enough for them. And that's the thing with Boyd. It's just the thing of, like, you know, Johnny looked like he was going to be a thorn in his side for a while, and then, like, last week it turns out, oh, Boyd had them all along there. Boyd has a drop on them all along. It's just it sort of keeps happening with Boyd of where – Somebody's a threat, but they never seem like as big of a threat. I don't know. I think Quarles was the last time he really had to sweat as far as somebody might end up really, really getting the better of him. Well, he truly didn't get through Thompson last year. But I just – I do have that little bit of a criticism right now. I, I do think that Boyd is not, you know, as they might say on the wrestling biz, showing enough ass at this point here. I, I just think some of the other, you know, criminal uh, rivals need to be a little bit more of a threat to him. Well, the interesting thing is I don't know that you've got any left for this particular season. I don't, I don't know Probably that anyone, not. you know, unless it's Picker somehow, mm-hmm. um, I don't see uh, a criminal element being the one that gets over on Boyd. Because or, or, basically what you're saying is he always wins and he needs to lose here and there. You can't go yeah. undefeated forever. And, well, and I'm going to throw vulnerable. something out there that I think most people that watch the show probably haven't thought of and probably don't want okay. to think of. I'm just going to say it. Because when you compare everything, everything seems to come down to Boyd's Enterprise and not Boyd's Enterprise. So just try to wrap your head around the idea and what it would mean based on his own emotional state feeling guilty, feeling responsible if Ava is taken out of the picture before season six. Wow. What if that's the loss? Okay. I mean, cause if, let's just say she dies. She's killed somehow before he can get her out of prison. That's going mm-hmm. that, I mean, to be – not we we try to cross over a lot here, and I'm going to do one that's just completely out of the box. That's like okay. a Harry Potter thing. Okay, and just to sum it up for those that are listening that don't give two blanks for Harry Potter, here's the deal. Harry Potter's not Harry Potter if his parents don't die. So what I'm saying is maybe Boyd Crowder doesn't become the Boyd Crowder he's going to become unless something catastrophic happens. And I can't think of anything worse for him emotionally than if um, Ava is taken from him before he can make things right now we probably could see the Boyd Crowder just become you know basically what he is now until it's over or we can see him become something so much worse Um, and if you're right and the fact that that he can't go undefeated for life something's got to happen and it's either going to either not going to happen before the season finale this season and it'll happen in season six or it'll happen catastrophically to close out season five before we get to season six. Well, all these are possibilities to be sure. And again, Ava tonight, the the danger for her just keeps getting upped and upped and upped. Uh, Her contact there, who is going to be protecting her slash setting up the drug ring with her, the nurse in the infirmary, ends up meeting on the outside with Boyd, gives him instructions uh, for a revenge killing, which Boyd fakes out the old guy that he's not going to do, that he's going to spirit him away, but in the end ends up having Jimmy uh, do do the job there. Anytime Boyd has to get up to quote unquote go to the bathroom or do something, look out. You know, it's happened with Sheriff Mooney, happened with the old guy in the truck. That's generally a sign that something real bad is about to happen. But uh, things are continuing to escalate worse and worse. You now have a situation where Ava has to take out Judith in prison, has to kill her, who has been her benefactor to this point, uh, as we saw earlier tonight when she saved her from a shanking. So Ava's going to have to make a choice which direction she's going to go in there. So, yeah, it's easy to see where the other uh, danger could lie with Ava going forward. Two things from that whole scenario. Um, one, I'm, I'm right on board with you because they, they, they sucked me in. I, I was buying a hook, line, and sinker. It, you know, just the idea of, like, maybe at this juncture, Boyd doesn't want to put more pressure on himself. Let's keep the body count where it is. I'll just pay this guy off. I had totally bought into the whole idea. 
And then the second you see the truck start to veer, I went, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and then when he says he's got to go to the bath, you know, it's, it's uh, my wife and uh, her family are huge Trekkies. And for those that aren't, uh, anytime you see a Star Trek person in a red shirt leave the ship, they're dead. It's just a little thing they wrote they wrote into the script. If you were wearing a, you know, uh, Starfleet red jersey shirt, you're dead. And end of story. It just it okay. almost never fails. And that's Boy Crowder going to take a piss is his red <laughs> shirt. It's you just know the second he's like, I'm gonna get out here and I'm gonna take a leak if you don't mind. And then even when he's like, says you know Jimmy, why don't you Give the man some of his money so he can relax. I'm like, oh, you're so dead, 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 dead. You're so dead. <laughs> and of course, that's exactly what happens. Uh, and the other thing from this whole scenario is um, <clears throat> um, the Ava thing in prison. Um, I'm kind of just riding along with it, just letting it happen. I'm not trying to think too much about it. Um, however, there's something about in a, I would assume as a male, I just wasn't prepared for this. Um, the female prison lingo, the part where the, the chick with the shiv is saying, unless you've got a gram shoved, and I'm going to stop there because it's a family program, I was floored. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, you, you hear that and you go, well, wait, oh, okay, so it's prison. It's got to be bad, but come on now. You couldn't say, you know. Shove down your pants or something? Anyway. Right. Uh, so and it just goes to the whole experience that one gets from uh, allowing yourself to be sucked into this whole show because, uh, you know, another in a long line of things that weren't expected but are absolutely realistic. Uh, and that whole I, – I got a bad feeling about the uh, the nurse. You know, I think something bad's either going to happen to her or something bad's going to happen to Ava because that's just shysty the way she just changed – the deal. Like, it was no big deal. Like, oh, you just got this yep. other little thing. No biggie. Are you serious? Yeah. You're, you're basically asking <laughs> me to go kill the Pope, you know, yeah. in Vatican well, City. So, Four episodes left. It really is ramping up. And, uh, again, Raylan is going to be on the case here the rest of the way uh, this season here with the, uh, the dope getting smuggled up from Mexico. He's going to be on that. We're going to be following that. I want to briefly get to the S.H.I.E.L.D. crossover and then to this other overarching note that I've got for tonight here. Brief S.H.I.E.L.D. crossover. I had been saying when I started watching the S.H.I.E.L.D. back around the beginning of February, Shane Vendrell, Walton Goggins' character on there, not nearly as good an all-around character as Boyd Crowder. I'm going to revise that slightly. Boyd Crowder, as you and I have indicated, is on the pantheon of recent TV characters. He he is one of the, the greats of this golden age of TV. Shane Vendrell, though, hang in there for the end of Season 5 and Seasons 6 and 7, and that is where he goes next level himself. Uh, Walton Goggins will probably never be lucky enough to play another character like Boyd Crowder, but Shane Vendrell as a 1A is not bad. I- I'm seeing that now. For everybody that told me to hang in there for that, um, I do get that. I do understand that. Uh, Now, this overarching note that I wanted to bring up tonight and get you to react to, Jason, based on something you and I came across after last week's episode, which, if you look around the Internet, a lot of people thought was kind of subpar. Got some some folks that I want to call out first, and before I do that, I want to call myself out, because I have, when I'm doing this show, okay, we do this in real time, I'm up for 14 hours, basically, uh, when we do this show. I can be a little bit tired. I had a couple of fumbles last week. I think I mangled the words coincidence and consequence. I think I said the wrong word there. I cringed when I listened back to that. And you said uh, the great episode from last season, and I immediately said convoy. No, it was decoy. So I got that wrong. But those are honest mistakes. Those are just if I'm a little bit tired doing it in real time, blurt out the wrong thing. There was a mistake that was made last week by some folks that was not an honest mistake. And it's another Justified podcast out there. I won't say a rival one because we're all part of the same critic community here, Hollerbeck, which is done by Joanna Robinson of Vanity Fair and Ryan McGee, who freelances for AV Club, Hit Fix, and Zap to it. So these folks are some heavy hitters out there in in the critics community. When when you've got some credentials like that put out there, they do a podcast. I check it out from time to time. 
I don't tend to listen to other podcasts as much as I do read stuff. I read everything on Justified. You, you've indicated, Jason, your wife, our entertainment editor at FDH, Samantha Jones, for her shows, she immerses herself in it. You're not that way. I am. It's, it's a matter of individual choice. I, I try to read everything I can on this. I really respect that you're able to formulate the takes you are just from yourself. For me, I have to see what other people are talking about and see if it makes sense, doesn't make sense, whatever. I'm a lot more like Samantha in that way. So I check out the one from last week. I had actually heard about this ahead of time. These guys did a three-minute podcast and did nothing but bitch about how horrible it was. You know what? We're not going to do a full-length one because it's just this crappy and, you know, we don't feel like, you know, bumming ourselves out, doing a long thing, just bitching about it. And, again, they generally do stuff that's a lot better than that. I'm not out to put them down or anything like that. But that was a really dumb thing that they did, and I thought it was really disrespectful to their audience. And I I think it was very, very ill-considered because – you got to go back to the framework of this show. And, again, I've been more open than you've been, Jason, to being down on this season. Now, I, I, I tonight, I'm like, okay, I, I at least see where they're going. I, I think this is going to be a good season. At this point, I'd be surprised if it was better than season four, and I'll regard that as disappointing because they've tended to make each one better than the last. Some of us feel the two was a little better than three, but still, it, it's tended to be one better than the next, better than the next. I don't know if they're going to do that at this point. Again, so I, I'm a little bit more pessimistic than you, but you and I are basically in about the same place, which is even the episodes that you don't quote-unquote like as much, they serve a purpose. And I went back to a quote, and this is what I want to get you to, re- to refer uh, to, to get your thoughts on. And that's uh, not so much a quote, I'm paraphrasing him. David Simon, who wrote The Wire, and his thoughts on critics and his thoughts on it, he bristles at the very notion of people doing – a review of one of his episodes, because he's like, what are you talking about? It's a chapter in a book. If you're looking at it in isolation, you're completely missing the point. I sat down and I did the math, Jason. There's 78 episodes of Justified, counting what's to come this season and next season. Every episode is 1.2% of the entire show. So if Joanna Robinson and Ryan McGee, who, like I said, I'm, I'm being a little bit harsh to them, even though I, I respect their abilities and I, I generally like what they do much better than that incident from last week, but they, they took their ball and went home and cried about it over 1.2% of the series. Or if you want to be really out on a limb here, 3.6%. If, if they were complaining about every episode since shot all to hell. So that's what I don't get, is that, again, this is a highly episodic show, or serialized, I guess is what I'm looking to say. Not completely like Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is 100% serialized. Maybe this is 90 to 95%. Because there, there are some standalone things in some of the episodes. And Uncle Jack last week was kind of a standalone thing. But, again, the reaction. I, I just, A, I don't think it's appropriate. I, don't th- I think it's disrespectful to your audience to do something like that. But, but also, again, if you're looking at it this way and you're just looking at in a vacuum, did this thing entertain me as much as some of the other ones that entertain me the most? No. Then I'm going to crap on it. Then I think you're doing it all wrong. Wow, we need a whole other show just for this. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, the the biggest issue here is I have not heard the rest of their stuff. So bear in mind and, and treat this like my response is like a you know a business traveler driving through Kansas City or something who doesn't know the area and I just turn turn on a radio station and just get that 3 minutes that's my experience so I can't speak to what they're good at or if they've had good podcasts previous to this all I can go off of is what I heard and, and here here's the deal I'm glad you brought up the thing about the chapters cuz I was actually going to hit that um they claim that this was by far the worst episode they've ever done, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but the the problem is, this is why I don't like critics who are just like straight up critics. It, it'd be different if they wrote something. It'd be different if they sat and put in time and pieced everything together and, and actually did the writing where they can go back and say, this is a bad episode and here is... 17 different reasons why then I would almost say okay fine you're coming from a place of creation I understand that and I respect that and that's your opinion and I'm fine with it that is not the case 
to my knowledge, these are just people sitting back watching just like the rest of us uh, who are crapping on the situation because they didn't feel fulfilled. Here's, here's the big problem. It is, a, it, it is a story. It is a story. It has a beginning and an end. And you have to build, and from time to time, you have to have chapters. And anybody that reads books, and I'm not even a big reader, I personally would much rather watch something than read. But the few times that I have read you know, novels or, or what have you, there are still entire chapters where you're like, I could have thrown that away. I don't even need that. This is different. There were things, details in that episode that I promise you are going to be important building blocks to something later. Whether we realize that in the next four episodes or not is a totally different story. So, yes, it absolutely is a chapter in a book. And in this sake, in, in this ex- uh, example, as you mentioned, there's 78 chapters. And within those 78 chapters, we have chapter, what, 58 or whatever it was. <clears throat> and in chapter 58... There were still parts that were enjoyable. It just wasn't as big as they had hoped. And that seems to be my big problem. Now, I challenge them or anybody else that hears this and wants to see where I'm coming from. I guarantee you, if you've watched the entire Justified series to date, go back and watch that episode again while it's still fresh in your mind. And then I dare you to go back and watch Season 1, Episode 2, through Season 1, Episode 6. And tell me with a straight face that you don't think that those first few episodes in in Season 1 were absolutely pedestrian compared to what we saw the other week. Because the fact of the matter is, in the early episodes of Season 1, excluding the pilot, the pilot I think was genius, but from Episode 2 until Season 1 really starts to get going, it's boring. It is comparatively boring because the whole thing is you have to see how Raylan works. You have to understand his relationships with Art and Rachel and Gutterson and so on, and it's so unbelievably comparatively boring. So if I put that episode that we watched last week up against any of those first few, it's not even close. So, yes, there is a respect, a, a, a disrespect for their audience, there is a disrespect for the product, and it's a little uh, irresponsible. I'm going to try to use, be careful with my words. I don't want to offend anyone, but it is a little irresponsible to say that just because it wasn't your favorite episode doesn't make it the worst episode. It is by far not the worst episode, and I will submit to you the uh, the dentist episode with the dude from uh, Ferris Bueller. That <laughs> It was a nice cameo, but that... That episode was so boring. Anyway, so all of that to say it wasn't anywhere near as bad as they made it out to be. Uh, and it was part of the process. It's part of the building of the story, essentially, from day one, is literally you're building. You're building and building and building until eventually you reach heaven or the whole thing comes crashing down. Um, so it was, it was necessary. Now, as far as the actual podcast goes, please. For the love of God and all that is holy, please, someone, get back to us and tell me that one of them had a recital to go to. Their kid was in a school play. (laughs) Tell me there was something in their life that was pressing, and they literally called up each other and said, Hey, I hate to do this to you, but I got a problem with our show this week. I got another priority. At least be honest and come out and tell me that there was something important in your life that you had to deal with that took precedence over the podcast, because at least that is forgivable. But to go on and basically produce a series of voicemails, which, if you listen to it, can't possibly be real. Uh, they have to have been made up the way that they were delivered. But anyway, that that's more of a production thing that I won't waste time with. But point being, tell me there was some other priority, because th- that is such a slap in the face to put together a series of what I think are fake voicemails just to say, oh, this episode was so bad, we're not even going to talk about it. Seriously? You really think that your listeners are that stupid? That they think that you think so little of one episode that you're willing to just walk away? Because if that's the case, you never should have done the podcast to begin with. That means that you don't believe in the product, you don't think it's a great thing to watch, uh, and you don't find value in in all of its facets. Because you basically just gave up. You mailed it in, 
and that's fine. But be, you know, be honest about it and say that there's, a, you know, 20 different things you'd rather be doing than talking about this episode. Because if you're really right. honest with yourself, the episode's important and you drop the ball. Well, that is that is very, very well said in our tiny remaining moments here. I'm going to note as well, too. Again, you and I are not blind fanboys. I was thinking about this as well. We called out elements of the whole Clover Hill storyline and the execution of it. And the fact that, like, hey, look, man, there's not really that level of class warfare in Appalachia. You and I have called out things on this. Season one, I agree with you. I don't know much of a, a desire to go back and watch much season one. I'm sure I will at some point. But, again, compared to what came after it, I agree with you. Pedestrian in comparison. Very well set on all of these points, as I knew it would be. I'm looking forward to 510 next week here. I'm looking forward to the last four episodes of the season. I can't believe we're already up to this point already. I'm looking forward to breaking it down with you once again, my man. Catch you next week, my friend. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL. Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.